Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our sixth annual Soapbox Nation event. Let's give it a hand for that. My name is Verne Green, and I have the privilege of being the CEO of Mikva Challenge. <laughs> Our mission at Mikva Challenge is to develop young people to be empowered, informed, and active civic leaders who will promote a just and equitable society. At Mikva Challenge, we envision a world that values youth voice, and that's why we are here tonight, and I'm so excited about that. <laughs> we are going to hear from 13 speakers tonight from across the country. We've chosen 13 speakers out of hundreds of thousands of young people who have given soapbox speeches this year. I know there are a ton of young people in the audience. If you delivered a soapbox speech, just wave your hand. Whether you're one of the 13 that's here, very nice. We are going to hear from six middle school students and seven high school students tonight. But know that kindergartners, first through fifth graders even, are giving speeches answering the question, what's the issue you care most about? Project Soapbox is Mikva's curriculum geared to teaching students how to develop, do the research, and deliver a speech on an issue they feel passionately about. Through the process, students identify qualities of a good speech, learn how to structure that speech, employ rhetorical devices and qualities of effective speech delivery, delivery. Equally as important, students are speaking up on those issues and then giving us some action, some steps that we need to take. And I'm gonna come back to that. We don't choose the topics. We at Mikva Challenge, the teachers who deliver the curriculum, I just really wanna stress that. We do not choose the topics, the students do. We issue the question and they've answered it and you'll hear those answers tonight. Project Soapbox could not happen without our teachers. And I just wanna pause for a moment. The applause you gave me, teachers, can you please stand and let's just make sure that you get your applause. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Teachers, who work with Mikva Challenge have prioritized centering youth voice in their classroom amongst the thousands of other priorities that they have. Teachers who at times have been stretched out of their comfort zone, we talked about comfort zone earlier today, to allow for courageous conversations in their classroom. Teachers who recognize that teaching is also learning and listening to their students. It is our profound honor to partner with you. Also, I'm gonna take just a brief moment. I stand here today because I had incredible teachers who believed in me and wanted to make sure that they helped me to understand the power of my voice. And this moment in this theater is actually a full circle moment for me. Many of you who know me know the first plane I ever took, I flew here to Washington, D.C., but what I didn't share was that during that experience, I was here in Ford's Theater as a 15-year-old up in the balcony watching a play. Had no idea that 30 years later, we would be welcoming young people back to this space to amplify that voice. So again, teachers, just commend you for what you do made me and are continuing to support our young people. Before we begin, I just want to take a brief moment to thank Ford's Theater for their unwavering partnership with us to bring this space. I also want to thank the Allstate Foundation, who has underwritten our National Youth Summit. This is the sixth year of Soapbox Nation, but it's the first year that Soapbox Nation has been the kickoff for Mikva's Challenges National Youth Summit. Many of the young people who are in the audience with us, there are about 100, represent students and represent high schools from as close as Washington, D.C. to as far away as California and are going to be with us for the next 
two days to continue to dialogue and advocate for the issues that are most important. If you are one of those 100 students, take a moment and please stand. These young people apply to attend this event. They apply to give their speeches tonight. They've done their job or they will be doing their job for the next couple of weeks. I just wanna to say to the adults who are listening here in person or who are listening via live stream, there's a job we have to do as adults too. Again, we did not choose the topics at Mikva Challenge, the young people did. We've asked them to tell us what's the most important issue to them and our job tonight is to listen. If you hear a speech and you know that you have the ability or the connections to help do something about the call to action that the young people issue to, to you, encourage you to reach out to us at MICFA Challenge. Reach out to us so that we can connect you to the young people because our, it's not just about a public speaking competition. It's about taking action. Our curriculum is called Issues to Action and just encourage you to listen, relate to them, but more importantly, take action on the things that they have named for you are priorities for them. At this moment, I would like to introduce Trisha Patrick from the Fourth Theater for some brief comments. Thank you all, and I'll come back up at the end of the program. Thank you for joining us. And welcome to Ford's Theater. We are delighted to have you all here this evening. I am Trisha Patrick, I'm the Director of Education, and it is my pleasure to work with my colleagues in advancing Ford's mission to explore the legacy of Abraham Lincoln and celebrate the American experience through theater and through education. Lincoln was a theater lover. He often sat in that very presidential box to enjoy a night of, of theater as a brief respite from the trials of civil war, including, including the night of his assassination by Confederate sympathizer John Wilkes Booth. President Lincoln was also a great orator. His words continue to inspire as they are echoed across the nation today. Our theater continues today as a partnership with the Ford's Theater Society and the National Park Service. And it, it is in partnership that we are gathered here today. We are so proud to share this historic stage with Mikva Challenge for this evening's Soapbox Nation. When the folks at Mikva Challenge reach out to us about hosting an event that centers student voice, it just made sense that it would be here. We at Ford's Theater believe in the power of oratory and that cultivating the voices of young people and educators and developing the skills to engage with our democracy is integral to the advancement of our nation. Young folks, speaking from this historic stage, you yourself are making history tonight. Your words and your actions have the power to affect change. Thank you all again for coming to Ford's and we hope that you will grace these halls again with your presence. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, my name is Robin Lingo and I get the great privilege of being the Chief of Strategy and Impact for Mikva Challenge. And Renee, um, oh, let me first say, we are so excited to welcome you all here to DC. Uh, we opened the Mikva DC office in about 2015 and it has steadily grown to serve thousands of young people across the city. And it has been a dream of ours to be able to host the National Youth Summit and to have young people from across the country come to DC and we welcome you to our city and we're so excited to be in community with you over the next couple of days. Uh, Renee talked a little bit about the why of why we're here, and I want to talk a little bit about the how, and how we're going to be together in this space, and how we're going to hold space for each of our young speakers who comes up to this stage. As Renee mentioned, 
Project Soapbox starts with a simple prompt. What is the biggest issue facing you and your community and what should be done about it? Each young person who comes to the stage tonight is being so brave and so open in offering their story, their perspective, and their call to action to us. And so as a community, we are gonna celebrate them, we are gonna hear them, we're gonna accept every speech with positivity and with love. I'm also gonna come back to that love in just a second because there's a real way you're gonna get to act it out with us. But I also wanna say that Soapbox is actually not a competition. Soapbox is an activity that is deeply about listening, that is about empathy, that is about hearing perspectives and stories that are different than ours. You may hear something that you disagree with. You may hear something that is vastly different than your life experience. We are holding the space to take in each person's story and know that we are all part of a community here tonight and we're celebrating each person's and listening and thinking about what does that teach us? What didn't we know before that we are leaving this space with a bigger perspective of the world around us? So let's get back to that celebrating. Earlier this afternoon, our 100 young people who are gathered here for the National Youth Summit practiced a signature mikvah move. It is called our wild applause. Wild applause is exactly as it sounds. As each young person comes to the stage and as each person leaves, we are going to celebrate them with the loudest, most enthusiastic, feet stomping, hand clapping, wild applause you can pull together. So. Our young people who we practiced this earlier tonight, can you help all of the adults who maybe have not had a chance to practice yet? We're gonna practice wild applause. One, two, three, go! Woo! Okay, I think that was pretty good. What do you guys think? Good? All right, well, we'll keep it going. We got 13 speeches, so the wild applause gets to grow and grow throughout the night. I am now want to introduce our wonderful hostess for the night, um, two fabulous site directors who make the mikvah magic happen in cities across the city, across the country. Please welcome to the stage, Carla and Mia. Hi, y'all. How are you guys doing today? Are you guys ready to hear some amazing speeches? I hope you are. We promise they're amazing. Are you ready to listen and learn and be inspired by these powerful young folks? Yeah. yeah. All right, well, I'm gonna get right to it then. I am so honored to bring up our first speaker. She is an eighth, eighth grader at PSIS 49 in New York City. Mikvah has been partnering with New York City since 2019, and it's now our largest partner site. Over 200,000 young folks got on their soapbox in their classroom this year, which is incredible. And we are very grateful to partner with the Civics for All team to make that happen. Our first speaker, when we asked her, why does youth voice matter? She said, because young people are the future of our generation. Please give Lily Harabedian a warm welcome. Come on up, Lily. <laughs> To quote Dina Nayari, it is the obligation of every person born in a safer room to open the door when someone in danger knocks. Last year, over 25,000 refugees fled their countries due to oppression, war, or natural disasters and were admitted into the United States. In years past, these numbers have passed 100,000. According to the Austin American Statesman, for every individual, the State Department provides a little over $1,000 to support housing, clothing, and food for up to 90 days. Asylum cases, on the other hand, could take years to process, and employment authorization for asylum seekers takes a minimum of six months to be granted. Even though refugees might be covered for their first few months, what should they do following this when they can't work? What do you do when year after year, a different group of refugees enter the country, and year after year, they aren't provided with enough resources to help them thrive with their transition into a new life? We cannot keep treating asylum seekers as if there's some new shiny toy to play with for a couple of weeks that then gets thrown away. My name is Lily Harabedian. My great-great-grandparents were refugees escaping the Armenian genocide in the beginning of the 20th century. When they came to America, 
They had no government assistance, and it took them ages to learn the language, get employment, and find a place to live. Unfortunately, this is the case for many other struggling refugees. I strongly believe that we can do more to help refugees adjust quickly and be successful in the United States. For starters, there are organizations that strive in supporting refugees' needs. The Human Rights First is a nonprofit that helps asylum seekers receive extra legal help, such as providing them with attorneys. By donating to organizations like this, displaced people will have a better chance at getting back on their feet faster. Another way to help is by letting your local representatives know that you support legislation that lowers the wait time for asylum seekers to receive all employment authorization documents. The more demand there is, the better the chances that politicians will act upon it. There should be no time wasted. Every second wasted is another homeless refugee, another job-deprived refugee unable to help their family. Why waste more time when we could have asylum seekers work the same jobs as regular citizens? Why waste more time when we could have asylum seekers be next door neighbors with regular citizens? Why waste more time when we could live in a world where asylum seekers are equals with regular citizens and have the same chance for a prosperous life? Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Woo. So there's this myth that young folks are apathetic. I think we just found out they're absolutely not. Thank you so much, Lily. And I'm looking forward to hearing all the other speakers that are coming up tonight who will continue to prove that. Carla, who's next? So up next, we have an amazing eighth grader from Spring Harbor Middle School in representing Fitchburg, Wisconsin, right outside of Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Mikva has been partnering with Madison Metropolitan District since 2017. And Madison is actually one of the first sites to incorporate the voices of incarcerated youth um, in their soapboxes. And when we asked our next speaker why youth voice mattered, um, they said that it is important for adults to hear the voices of young people and what matters to them. Our voices are as important as adult voices. Help me welcome to the stage, Nick Robinson. Imagine. You're driving home after a long day of work. It's dark outside, and the only light is coming from your car radio. Then a new light comes in. It's some red and blue lights belonging to a police officer. You're getting pulled over. You wonder why, because you know you're going the speed limit. You stop on the side of the road, and the officer gets out of his car and asks you for your license. Then he asks you if you're carrying any drugs. You say no, but he still goes on to call for three other police officers and has your car sniff for drugs by dogs when you didn't have any and you never had any. This is a real situation that happened to my African-American dad. He was driving through a high drug area on his way to visit a friend and ended up getting pulled over and having his car sniffed for drugs. And after that unnecessary 20 minute ordeal, he still got a warning ticket. Now, if you don't know what a warning ticket is, it's basically a formal way for an officer to let you know you broke the law while driving, but you're not getting charged or fined. This is just one of the many times my dad has been th pulled over throughout his life. Now think of the 41.6 million African Americans that live in the US and the amount of times they've been pulled over. Hi, I'm Nick Robinson. I'm biracial and I'm the son of Rob Robinson and the brother of Diamond Robinson. And I am fed up of coming home and hearing stories about how they're racially discriminated throughout their day. Or hearing on the news that another African American life was lost due to police violence, but there are no charges for the officer at this time. But, police but racial discrimination isn't just present in police violence. It's present in jobs, schools, out in the world, and more. In schools, black children are 54% less likely, likely to be placed into gifted programs than white children. But if their teacher was black, they are three times more likely to be placed into those programs. Black children are more likely to get punished than white children across all ages. They're more likely to get suspended, expelled, and even arrested. But this racial dis this discrimination doesn't just happen in high school. It doesn't just happen in middle school or elementary school. No, this goes way back to preschool. Yeah, you heard me right, preschool. 
Because when black children are only 19% of the preschool enrollment, they are 47% of the preschoolers out of preschool suspended at once. When white children are 43% of the preschool enrollment, they're only 28% of the preschoolers out of preschool suspended. There's also racial discrimination when hiring African Americans versus white people. According to www.chicagobooth.ed, a study found that out of 5,000 resumes, black sounding names on a resume were 50% less likely to get a callback than white sounding names on a resume, no matter the quality. And even if the African American gets hired, they still face racial discrimination on the job. My dad, who is a respiratory therapist, which means he helps people who has trouble breathing, faces racial discrimination by some of his patients. Some people will say, I don't want him to treat me because he's black, or I don't want a black man touching me when all he is trying to do is to help. Finally, there's just racial discrimination out in society. According to www.pewresearch.org, when adult African Americans were asked if they faced racial discrimination in the past year, half of them said someone has acted suspicious of them, 47%. Or they acted like they weren't smart, 45%. Or they're unfairly treated by an employer in hiring, pay, or promotion, 21% or they're just unfairly stopped by police, 18%. Now, I wish I could come up here and say I was, instead of I am to describe this horrendous issue. I wish I could say I was sad that roughly seven out of 10 African Americans say they face racial discrimination in their life, including the 11% who say they experience it on a regular basis. I wish I could say I was tired to know that African Americans are treated unfairly based on the color of their skin. I wish I could say I'm happy to know that there are big changes in people's minds about African Americans. I wish I could say I am ecstatic to know that big government figures are making speeches and laws to stop the disadvantage that most African Americans face. I wish I could say I am delighted to know that African Americans don't have to worry about being hurt or killed by police, or they just can't get the opportunity, opportunity they've been working hard for for so long, or they just can't do their job, or they just don't feel like they're being treated differently because of the color of their skin. Now. The tools that are being used to help heal this issue is that there are people of all races speaking out against this issue. There's articles, protests, books, famous people all speaking out against this issue, and it's mostly what we, can, what we need. But we need more forcible action, like laws against racism. For example, police are required to have their body cameras on at all times, and that footage is monitored by a separate party, not just other police. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to stand up and inform people of this topic. I want you to make sure that you and the people around you are treating people equally and fairly, and not just unfairly based on the color of their skin. And if we can do that, we can make a better world, a world where everyone is treated equally and fairly. That's the world that I would like to see. Would you? Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Nick. I love that stance at the end you did, just looking at everybody. Um, you know, there are some people that are concerned that talking about difficult topics in school can, can sometimes be harmful for young people, especially in middle school. But I think as Nick showed us, it's in imperative that we talk about these issues in the classroom, in a safe space, with a safe adult, with our peers. So thank you so much for taking the time to do that, Nick. And I'm so excited to hear the rest of the brave people that are gonna come up on stage now. Yes, our next speaker is an eighth grader at Lassiter Middle School in Louisville, Kentucky, at, in Jefferson County, where Louisville is. Um, our partners there are some of the folks we work with around the country who use our curriculum in elementary school, so all the way down to kindergarten. And I'm just, it's incredible to see when folks don't underestimate even our youngest speakers. It's never too early to be civically engaged. Our next speaker, when we asked them why Youth Voice Matters, said, it's important to have fresh ideas from young minds. I could not agree more. Please welcome Aster Cohn to the stage. Why do people think that mental health problems don't happen with kids too? Most people will shrug it off when it's brought up, but it's something we should not shrug off when a kid is feeling like they're alone in this world. I don't know why people think it's okay to say to kids, asking for help, it's, you're, just, you're just faking it for attention. You probably are just, you're probably not feeling, you're too young to feel this way and way more. 
If you want your kids to be honest with you, help them when they ask for help. You are, it's, it's okay to feel this way. You are worthy and deserving of help. From a news article in US News, nearly 10% of hospitalized children are diagnosed with a mental illness, but, but a majority of children, children are frequently overlooked. It's basically justifying that people need to learn that kids are human too. If mental health was a problem kids could be honest with adults with, uh, then they would get the help they need. The world would be way more trustworthy and there'd be less kids going through the same thing I went through. Think as, a, as an adult, you're depressed and you ask for help. You get it. Friends talking to you, people you care about reaching out. But when, when you're a kid, it's overlooked like a small cut. If you treat it as soon as, as possible, it's not a big deal. But if, but if you don't, it gets, grows infected and they need someone to help them because they don't know how to deal with it. From an article in Child Focus, a University of Michigan Health Lab study shows that nearly 7.7 .7 million teenagers and children suffer from an undiagnosed mental health disorder. disorder. This figure is staggering. More alarming is that only half of these 7.7 .7 million received needed treatment from a mental health professional as of 2016, end quote. With these numbers, something needs to get changed, and I'm here to change it. My job for all kids feeling this way and thinking it's not important First of all, your mental health is important. And secondly, talk to a trusted adult. It could be a teacher, your counselor, your guardian. I swear there's gonna be someone that will help you. Heck, all will care. I promise no matter what you're going through, it's gonna be okay. I thought I couldn't make an impact with this speech, but here I am making an impact. Not only have I changed my school, I hope I've changed your mind on this too. You are worthy and deserving of help. Thank you so much, Aster. You know, a lot of young people got on their soapbox about mental health this year and in previous years. I think a lot of adults may know that this is a big issue, and Aster's speech really underscores that we need to be engaging young folks in creating those solutions to address this enormous issue. So thank you so much, Aster. And I'm gonna turn to Carla to introduce our next speaker. Up next, we have a seventh grader from William P. Gray Elementary, representing Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> Uh, Chicago, Illinois is uh, my hometown and also the hometown of our founders, Abner and So Mikva. Um, Mikva Challenge began in Chicago 20 years ago, and I am a product of that program. I graduated in 2004. Woo! Um, it is also the place where we have had all of, uh, it was our founding chapter, and a place where we get to pilot a lot of the programs that we get to then share with the, the rest of the site, so that's pretty amazing. And when we asked our young speaker why youth matters, um, she said that because young people need to be heard and treated the same as others, we have a lot to say. So please help me welcome to the stage, Maya. I want you all to close your eyes. Imagine you have a one-year-old baby and take her to the emergency room for an urgent checkup. Later finding out the exact day, she has stage four mesoblastic nephroma. Stage four mesoblastic nephroma is stage four kidney cancer. How would you feel? How would you react and deal with this? My parents were in this situation. I had stage four kidney cancer. As many parents would react, they were devastated to hear this. They didn't know what to do and how they would deal with this. Because of me having cancer, we had to live in the hospital for four months. My dad had to work two jobs to support my mother and I, and we still couldn't afford to pay rent. My parents had to give up their studio apartment because of how expensive the bills were. If the government had not let a hand to my parents by paying the expensive medical bills, I wouldn't be here and standing and talking to you all about this problem. The bills for my chemotherapy would be over $40,000. This is a problem people in the world are facing. People go bankrupt all the bills we have to pay just to stay healthy. 
a little over 40% of adults can't even access proper health care because of how expensive the bills are. According to a study from a team led by Johns Hopkins Bloomberg of Public Health, the United States has a 30% higher price in capital health care than Switzerland and 110% higher prices than Canada. With all these percentages, you can tell here in the United States, medical care is way too much. Despite our higher costs, our standard of health care is worse than the United Kingdom, Switzerland, Sweden, and many other industrialized countries. Our overall health care spending in the United States is due mainly to having higher prices, which include drug prices, higher salaries for doctors and nurses, higher hospital administration costs, and higher prices for many medical services. Many people usually think ambulances are either free or affordable. If you think this, you've got the wrong idea. Without insurance, the average cost of just one ambulance is more than $2,000. What if you didn't have anywhere to stay, like me and my parents did? Americans spend an excessive amount of medical bills, medical basics. $13,300 is what the average hospital stay in the United States is. Not many people can afford that cost. People are dying out there. They are suffering for, and for what reason? Not many, just because they can't afford overpriced healthcare. The pharmaceutical industry only cares about their profit and not about the people who are suffering to be alive. We need to wake up and take action. Many medical industries, such as the pharmaceutical industry, have lobbyists that are millionaires speaking for us. What do they even know what we, as not millionaires, are suffering? They don't even know what we are going through. They're only fighting for themselves and not for us. We have to elect politicians that see healthcare as a human right. We need to elect politicians that want to establish Medicare for all. This will lead to a significant step to catch up to Norway, Switzerland, and many other nations to ensure every American has access to affordable health care. It's time for a change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maya. Um, I want to make note that we have an awesome interpreter on stage with us today. And I just want to give them a round of applause. Uh, I do want to ask you to move closer to us just so that we can be, make sure that everyone, everyone's voices can be heard and in, in whatever way that they are able to, right? Um, thank you, Maya. I know that it can be incredibly overwhelming to look at an issue and not know how you're going to tackle it. And I think Maya showed us that no matter how big the issue, the first step is just talking about the issues that you care about. And that's why we are so proud of everyone that is um, joining us today on stage. So thank you, Maya, for, for showing us like that that first step is speaking up about an issue no matter how large. Ooh, yeah. Awesome, and I'm very excited to bring up our next speaker who's a seventh grader at Ware Middle School in New Hampshire. So New Hampshire is a really unique partner site for us uh, because of the small nature of school districts, many of them rural. We get to partner with the entire state, which is amazing. And our next speaker is here representing the state of New Hampshire. When we asked her why Youth Voice Matters, she said, because we are the future of this country and even though we are young, we should still be heard. Absolutely. Come on up, Ava Montgomery. My name is Ava Montgomery. I'm a 13-year-old girl growing up in a world being taught my body, my choice. That I have the right to choose what I allow to happen in my life and with my body. That I am the one in control. Also in today's world, that women have equal rights to men, but no longer with our bodies. I'm going to be there are no laws telling men what they can and cannot do with their bodies. I'm going to be talking to you today about abortion laws and how they now go against everything I've been taught for the first 12 years of my life. This topic is very controversial and debated often in our government. There is a saying called pro-choice, meaning you have the choice whether or not to have an abortion. You have the choice on what your future looks like, and you have the choice whether or not you're in a good position to care for a child. The saying pro-life means that you should not be allowed to have an abortion. The reason for this is because many people believe abortion is murder. However, many women and young girls are raped or sexually assaulted, and it results in a pregnancy they didn't plan or ask for. Sometimes it's even by a family member, causing serious birth defects. 
This new law on abortion forces these women to carry these babies or spend hundreds of dollars they might not have to travel to a state that still allows women to have the choice. What if a woman doesn't have a stable home to provide for a child? If you're a woman of any age forced into having a child and you can't provide food for yourself, how are you going to provide for a baby? Infants need many things, such as formulas, diapers, and clothing. Currently, the formula prices are skyrocketing, making this even more difficult to support an infant. Women and young girls are now forced to carry or deliver babies they may not have asked for, can't care for, or provide for, and may not even survive long after delivery. A mother's health is now no longer considered with these new laws, even if it could put her life in danger or even kill her. In addition, if a teen were to get pregnant, they most likely don't have a stable home or a job, and they may not even be able to drive yet. How are you supposed to get your child to the doctors or get more supplies? If you aren't mature enough to drive yet, you probably aren't mature enough to care for a baby. According to the website, pewresearch.org, the number of abortion providers have now gone down due to the new laws. Now in Texas, doctors could actually go to prison for life and be fined up to $10,000 for performing an abortion, and for the moms, up to about two years, and fined $1,000 for having one, even if it could save her life. According to NPR.org, abortion is currently illegal or heavily restricted in at least 16 states. Some of the states that are on permanent ban are t Texas, Arkansas, and Wyoming. The reason that abortion is banned in multiple states is to save a life, not even considering the life of the mother to be, whether it be physical, mental, or emotional. Although some women can overuse abortion, meaning that they get pregnant irresponsibly, I believe that is a very important right to have. The reason for this is because some women can get pregnant, but other women can get put in bad situations, and that causes them to still need the choice. And not having the choice could cause major problems. Being a 13-year-old girl growing up in a world where now my basic rights and choices about my own body have been taken away from me is a very scary feeling. What's next for me and my rights to choose? What else if only at 13 years old I already have no say over my own body? This law goes against everything I've been taught. As a young girl, this world would seem a lot less scary if we could go back to my body, my choice. No one but me should be able to tell me what happens to my body ever. And I want to change this. With more people speaking on this topic, if we take away the choices of the states, meaning to have the federal law change the choice of making abortions legal or illegal, vote for senators and House of Representatives that have the same idea as us. We need to come together and end this world problem. We have countless petitions for people to sign. You can sign at change.org. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ava. So y'all may be noticing that all the speakers we've heard so far tonight are in middle school. Let me say that again, they're in middle school. So let's not underestimate young folks because middle schoolers have really important things to say and I'm so glad we are listening tonight. Let's keep listening. Um, I'm gonna turn it to Carla to introduce our last middle school speaker before we hear our high school speakers as well. I'm so excited to introduce seventh grader from Cantwell Bridge Middle School representing Townsend, Delaware. He's part of the Newcastle County group that is joining us today. Is Delaware in the house? Hey! Uh, we are very lucky to work with four different districts in Delaware. And when we asked our speaker, why does youth voice matter? He said, we are all unique, so all of our voices matter. Uh, please help me welcome to the stage, Ryan Volpe. who Chester Bennington is? He was an American singer and songwriter. He was best known as the lead vocalist for the rock band Linkin Park. Chester Bennington hung himself by a doorknob in 2017 when he was 41 years old. He suffered from depression and often abused drugs and alcohol most of his life. His wife claimed that he seemed normal and happy the days before he killed himself. He wasn't. He was suffering in silence like most men do. Hello. I'm Ryan Volpe, and today I'm talking to you about men's mental health. According to MindWise Innovation, nearly one in 10 men experience some form of depression or anxiety, but less than half seek treatment. 
In 2020, men died by suicide 3.88 more times than women. Though men experience a higher rate of suicide, they're less likely to seek help since there's a stigma about men reaching out about their problems. Men do not want to feel or want others to think of them as incomplete or weak if they reach out to someone. Another huge aspect of men's mental health is veterans. 90% of veterans are male. Many veterans get post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD for short. PTSD is a psychiatric disorder that may occur in people who have experienced or witnessed a traumatic event, series of events, or set of circumstances. An individual may experience this as emotionally or physically harmful or life-threatening and may affect mental, physical, social, and or spiritual well-being. Veterans are labeled as tough and strong people. They feel like they can't reach out and they kill themselves. If we solve these issues, we would have a society where men can know that it's okay for them to reach out about their emotions. Just in 2020, we could have saved 130 men a day. These are the symptoms of someone suicidal. If you notice anyone that has or is starting to have these, reach out. Increasing the use of alcohol or drugs, acting anxious or agitated, behaving recklessly, sleeping too little or too much, withdrawing or feeling isolated, showing rage or talking about seeking revenge, and displaying extreme mood swings. As a society, we need to teach men that it's okay to reach out. We need to teach men that they will not be judged. We need to make it normal for men to cry and show emotion. We need to reach out and help men that might be suffering in silence. Men's mental health is killing your son. Men's mental health is killing your husband. Men's mental health is killing your dad. Men's mental health is a killer. Uh, if you're having trouble with suicidal thoughts, you can call the suicide hotline number. It is 988. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. I feel like that's a topic that I don't usually hear about, so I was really excited that um, I got to learn about it. Um, can I get a show of hands? Who has learned something tonight so far? Awesome, amazing. Okay, so we are halfway through. All of our middle schoolers have gone, and so I want us to take a little break. So if you could all stand up, and if you have ventured into our uh, Vimeo or YouTube page, you'll see that there's a lot of speeches, and there's one specific one where we were remembering it, Rayvon. Um, he said that what's really important to talk about is that uh, no matter what, we should start a conversation. So with that in mind, we're going to start a conversation tonight. So I want you to look to your left or to your right or in front or behind. Whoever is a neighbor that you don't know should be a new neighbor. Turn to a new neighbor, and you're going to introduce yourself and talk, start a conversation about something that you learned tonight. Go for it. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. I think they were trying to get the right shot, and at first you weren't on it, but now you are. Back where you were. Thank you. All right. So good to hear conversations happening. Sounds like everyone learned something new. All right.
Grab a seat again. Come back, come back to us, come back to us. Amazing. It was so good to hear you all chit chatter because that means that so much was learned and we're only halfway through. So, Mia, are you ready to kick us off with the high schoolers? Yes, I'm really honored to introduce our first high school speaker of the night. She is a junior at Riverside STEM High School. Something that's really special about our Riverside partner site is this last local soapbox event that they hosted, they had young folks facilitating, which yes, love to see young people leading in all spaces, so that's really, really cool. Um, when we asked our speaker why Youth Voice Matters, she said, because we should influence our future, please join me in welcoming Adrian Osmena to the stage. <laughs> I don't really agree with that lifestyle. Oh, and don't start spreading things around. The LGBTQIA community has faced ignorant comments like that for decades upon decades. Harmful biases against queer lives muddle sincere discussions about sexual safety. Comprehensive sex education secures the person's ability to express their sexuality and equips them with the actions they must take to prevent unwanted outcomes. But if we allow dehumanizing assumptions to lead conversations on sex education, it only ends disastrously. And as seen in our country's history, deadly. Let me take you to America in the vibrant, vivacious 80s. HIV ravaged the nation, infecting mostly gay and bisexual men. Seen as a divinely ordained consequence of gay liberation, Fervent conservatives attached HIV to queer identities, a stigmatizing stain on homosexuality. President Ronald Reagan actively promoted this homophobic idea. It was his duty, his responsibility to protect his citizens, but he chose to defame AIDS victims, offering no federal help in promoting sexual awareness. And what came as a result? The death of 100,000 American citizens between 1981 to 1990. The queer community was ridiculed, disregarded, and deceived. But through the advocacy of countless LGBTQ-led movements, the stigma surrounding HIV has subsided, allowing for more meaningful sex education. But is it truly effective? According to the Human Rights Campaign, 30% of gay and bisexual men do not feel comfortable disclosing their sexual behaviors to healthcare providers. We need comprehensive sex education that distinguishes sexuality from STD prevention to ensure a safe clinical environment. The California Healthy Youth Act, passed in 2016, promised its students the inclusion of affirmative discussions about all sexual identities, as well as the denouncement of damaging social views surrounding HIV AIDS. Last year, I completed a digital edition of Making Proud Choices, one of California's approved sex ed curriculums. It made important clarifications about HIV, but it did not treat queer relationships with the respect the Healthy Youth Act promised. Queer identities were barely mentioned, and it was always brought up in the context of HIV AIDS prevention. Understanding how AIDS impacted the queer community as a result of the Reagan administration's lack of care for unprejudiced sex education is vital in approaching LGBTQ issues in the modern day, because HIV is not their identity. Education like this reinforces harmful stereotypes that discourage real protection for queer lives. And as we've seen on a national scale, discrimination toward the queer community has only run more rampant. You have seen the book banning. You have seen the proposal of laws that expel any mention of sexuality in the classroom. You have seen it all. This is recent, it's terrifying, and it must be addressed. Sex ed is meant to protect the youth, but so long as our parents, guardians, and elders fear conversations on sexuality, we are forbidden the security that comes with lessons on sexual safety. We can no longer neglect the value of comprehensive, inclusive sex ed. We deserve a world where the youth feel safe, confident, and affirmed in their identities. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Adrian. I think she and, and really all our speakers underscore how important young people's perspectives are as we work towards issues that face our communities and that so often they are really the best messengers for those perspectives as we do that work. So thank you again, Adrian. And I'll turn it to Carla. I am so excited to introduce, I'm always excited, I'm so excited <laughs> to introduce uh, our next speaker. He is a senior at um, Edison Technology High School. He's representing Rochester, New York. Um, in Rochester, New York, they not only do soapbox, but during the pandemic, they actually started implementing students, student voice committees, and they have been actively working to create more inclusive and uh, safer and stronger school communities. And when I asked our next speaker, why is youth voice important? He said, because we are tomorrow's future today. Help me welcome to the stage, Alex Santiago. Alex! If you were to open your phone, what would you see? Nine times out of 10, you would see social media apps. According to Pew Research Center, 95% of teens have a smartphone. Out of that percentage, 45% of teens are online almost constantly. And out of that percentage, 35% are on one social media platform almost constantly. Social media is good for multiple reasons. Being able to talk to family and friends from far away is such a good positive. And the creativity and the opportunities from social media is something you cannot pass up. But for a student like me, social media is something we should be worried about in our classroom, and the mental health of students. Let's take a look at school. We have to get up early at around 4 to 6 a.m. And being on our phones before going to bed is affecting us. According to Health Essentials, your smartphone habits are affecting your sleep and your brain's health. It keeps our brain engaged, and the blue light filter from our phones throw off our circadian rhythm, which is our 24-hour internal clock. So when we get to school, we will be more tired and less engaged, leaving us to sleep in class. 71% or three-fourths of teens who spend more than one hour on social media have a suicide risk factor. These risk factors make students not want to come to school, leaving them failing or even dropping out. 73% of students feel like they've been bullied in their lifetime. And because of COVID-19, most of it is cyberbullying on social media apps. TikTok, an app almost everyone uses, has new TikTok trends every day. And you'll see students doing them from happening on the app or right in front of you. I have seen what TikTok is doing to students like me, from dancing outside or taking up stairwells just for their newest TikTok trend to post on their account. Out of all social media apps, I have not seen more of an app corrupt students' brains unlike TikTok. Sneaking phones in to use TikTok, Snapchat, or Instagram, and not worrying when their paper is due the next day, or if there is a test. A trend that involves violence is the skull breaker challenge, in which the victim jumps and use their legs to make them fall backwards, hitting their skull on the floor, causing serious injury. We've seen a lot of trends over the years causing harm to people, mostly teenagers and kids who don't know the repercussions. Let's talk more about TikTok dances. As a whole, dancing is a beautiful thing, but there is a time and a place. What if you as a student is trying to get to class and can't because people are trying to do the newest TikTok dance on the stairwell? And when a school fight happens, students run into the crowd to record it instead of going and asking for help, just to post it on their social media. Social media, even though it can be good, too much negative things happen on there, leading to bullying, injury, and even suicide. So let's just put the phones away and go outside. Maybe grab some friends and have fun without the worry of seeing what's on social media. Kids need to know why we shouldn't be on our phones 24 seven. And parents need to be watching their kids when they go on these sites, maybe having limits or maybe lowering their screen time. Kids should not need to be on these apps all day long just to wake up, be on social media, and repeat the same process every day. So when you go home, if you are a teen or a parent, look out before we get posted on these apps for something we don't want to be known for. And rip A. Blinken, bro. Thanks so much, Alex. Uh, as, you, as you heard, 
Young people do not always share unilateral experiences. Um, and the beauty of tonight is that we get to hear different perspectives from you know, different backgrounds of our young people. And how often do we really get a chance to do that? Not really that much. And how amazing would it be if we got a chance to do that? The divide that is happening in our nation might, might not be happening if everyone got a chance to hear from different perspectives. And I'm excited to keep hearing more perspectives. All right, our next speaker is a sophomore at Alice Hill High School in Salinas, California. All right, hi Salinas. Our partners in Salinas have doubled the graduating seniors who are earning the state seal of civic engagement, which is incredible. And our next speaker, when we asked them why Youth Voice Matters, said, because we have the vision for the future and we are willing to make a change. Please welcome Melissa Zavala. <laughs> Despite Salinas being called the salad bowl of the world, the field workers who labor to put food on our tables are still going unappreciated. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Salinas, 18% of the Salinas workforce includes agricultural workers, close to 12,000 people. The majority of these field workers don't have the best living conditions, with sometimes eight men living in one crowded room. Despite these conditions, field workers do their best to make sure their children have a good education. My name is Melissa Zavala, and I'm here today to show awareness to the challenges field workers face every day. This issue is important to me as my parents, along with the parents of most of my classmates, are field workers. According to Farm Progress data, Salinas produces an 85% of the nation's summer vegetables, 50% of its strawberries, and a large percentage of fruits and nuts, all picked and processed by these hardworking individuals. They should be given credit and respect for the valuable job they do. According to Bureau of Farm Records, most farm workers work for approximately six months in terrible weather in both brutally hot and bitterly cold conditions. Many folks at comfortable desk jobs don't usually acknowledge the fact that the fruits and vegetables are hand-picked and packed by these hardworking individuals. Those who don't work in agriculture tend to think that this job is easy and are not aware of the dangers field workers face, like being poisoned from pesticides. The EPA estimates that 300 fuel workers were poisoned last year in Salinas alone. And according to government OSHA records, 14 fuel workers have, in Salinas have died from heat exhaustion since 2005. On weekends, my parents and I like going out on their only day off, which is a Sunday. Sometimes when driving past some of the fields, I see people parked on the sides of the road pretending they are taking pictures, picking as if they were picking strawberries themselves. Moments like these make me realize that far too many people just don't take the field workers' job seriously. When elementary schools have a career day, field workers are never asked to be part of the presentation, making it seem as if having this job is not worthy of being a career. Although, it is understandable that most parents would not like to see their child grow up to work in such a difficult job, it is important to show children the importance of field workers in addition to police officers, firefighters, and doctors. So, what should we do? Schools should dedicate more time to teaching their students about the jobs that their parents have and their significance. In this case, providing food for large parts of the country. Showing our students the positive effect field workers have in Salinas and in California will help our students understand how lucky they are to have such hardworking parents in their community. It will also help our agricultural workers feel proud of their job and allow others to appreciate the truly difficult but vital job they do for all of us. Thank you. Yes, that wild applause. I cannot believe that we are coming down to our last three speakers of the evening. I am not ready for it to be over, but I am really, really looking forward to hearing what those last three young people have to say. I'm gonna turn it to Carla to introduce our next person. There's four, they wanted us to know. Oh, I did my math wrong, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you have each other's backs, I love that. Uh, up next, we have a junior from Adelaide E. Stevenson High School. They are representing Sterling Heights, Michigan, part of our Metro Detroit area. Uh, Mikva has led the David Bonnier Soapbox Challenge for the last five years there. And when we asked our speaker, 
why is it important to hear and to value youth voice? They said, because without our voices, the future would not be what it could be. So please help me welcome to the stage, Isabella May. If I don't make it, I love you and appreciate everything you've done for me, said Sarah Crescitelli. Can you imagine receiving that text from your child, sibling, spouse, or even best friend? Unfortunately for Stacey Crescitelli, that nightmare became real. Practicing on stage, everyone was preparing for the upcoming musical, singing, dancing, laughing, until bang, gunshots started to go off. Not just one, but enough to take the lives of 17 people and injuring 14 others. Yes, Sarah survived after hiding in the bathroom for two hours, but can you imagine how that exact moment changed the rest of her life? The Stone Man shooting was just one of the 107 mass shootings that occurred in 2018. Maybe that number doesn't sound big to you. In 2022, at least 3,179 people were shot, both killed and injured in the US. Do you think strengthening gun control would make a difference? Because I sure think so. What's wrong with trying to enforce something that will bring no harm to society and potentially peace? As a junior in high school, I don't want to be scared to go to school, knowing a school shooting occurred just about 28 miles from where I live. On November 30, 2021, Tate Meyer, Hannah St. Juliana, Madison Baldwin, and Justin Shilek all had their lives snatched from them. Guns gave us freedom is one of the most absurd things someone can say. Freedom is the idea that people are free to do whatever they want under the circumstance that no one is being harmed. 107 school shootings in 2018, 112 in 2019, 113 in 2020, 240 in 2021, and 257 in 2022. Does this not consider hurting anybody? Freedom? Where's the freedom of families whose lives have changed forever? If gun controls aren't put in place, this number will only go up. Even if you don't have direct experience with school shootings, have some sympathy for families' lives who have changed forever because of your decision to oppose gun control. You never know how much you regret something until it affects you. In order to combat this problem, we need to end the Dickey's Amendment. Since 2001, the CDC has not been able to fund any research studies about gun control, despite knowing it is one of the top five reasons for deaths in the US. Why? It is because of the Dickey's Amendment that was put in place to supposedly stop supposedly stop the, stop the anti-gun bureaucrats at NAIH and CDC from producing biased anti-Second Amendment research about gun control. To me, that just sounds like a bunch of excuses to protect the Second Amendment, not us, Americans. So please, if you have some sympathy for families who's, who have to mourn for their loved ones for the rest of their lives, go out and demand your representatives and senators to overturn the Dickey's Amendment. Thank you. Thanks so much, Isabella. Um, Project Soapbox teachers tell us how uh, impactful Project Soapbox can be in their classroom because um, they do it at the beginning of the year sometimes and young people that don't know each other get a chance to talk about what they care about and then get to know each other a little better. And Mia and I have gotten to experience that because for the past two days we've been hanging out with this wonderful group of young people and it's only been 24 hours and some of them just landed today and they're already like best friends and so we want to like just say thank you for being such troopers but also like if you ever want to speak up about an issue you care about like vulnerability breeds vulnerability vulnerability so speak up and people will likely open up and also talk about issues that they care about with you so continue to talk about it and let's continue with the speeches Mia. Awesome, yeah, the, the past couple of days really have been magic. Um, and we see the magic happen in classrooms around the country. Our next speaker is a junior at Houghton High School, which is part of our Marquette, Michigan partner site. And in Marquette for the past five years, Mikva has hosted the Tom Baldini Soapbox Challenge. Uh, time flies, I can't believe it's been five years. Go Marquette. And our next speaker, when we asked him why Youth Voice Matters said, because youth are, change for our future. Please join me in welcoming Ian Evans to the stage. Wow, 
One day this past fall, when I was walking down the hallway, I stopped to avoid running into another student who had cut across my path. As a result, the students walking behind me were forced to stop as well, and one of them decided to call me something. Do you want to know what they called me? A fucking faggot. I wish I could say the ideas behind that language are few and far between, but they're not. These bigoted and hateful opinions exist nationwide and stem from the same lack of education, awareness, and understanding, all while hurting and even killing real people. There is a taboo around being gay, anything gay, even just the word. Saying it even makes me a little uncomfortable. The taboo around it is extremely similar to those surrounding serious crimes such as rape and even murder. These aren't topics to be discussed with children. They're for private adult conversations that end when a child enters the room. This treatment of the topic teaches kids that these are horrific crimes and hateful feelings developed towards the perpetrators. However, when the LGBT community is treated in the same way, with hushed voices as if it's inappropriate, homophobia and transphobia develop in children, and those resentful feelings only grow with age. My own cousin, who was only 10 at the time, once told me that I was bad and evil. As a surprise to no one, these feelings have made their way into our government. For example, Representative Mike Johnson of Louisiana introduced the Stop the Sexualization of Children Act in 2022, which in reality was a national don't say gay bill. It would have banned books and the teaching of curriculums containing sexually oriented material, which was defined as any depiction, description, or simulation of sexual activity, any lewd or lascivious depiction or description of human genitals, or any topic involving gender identity, gender dysphoria, transgenderism, sexual orientation, or related subjects for children under 10. Laws like this have been implemented across the country, some even extending K through 12. These censorship laws strengthen the taboo surrounding the LGBT community, ultimately causing more homophobia and transphobia to develop within our country. And this is a serious problem. It's hurting people, even killing them. The American Psychiatric Association says that LGBTQ people are more than twice as likely to develop a mental health disorder, specifically 2.5 times more likely to experience anxiety, depression, and substance misuse. According to the CDC and the Trevor Project, suicide is the second leading cause of death for young people aged 10 through 24, with LGBTQ young people four times more likely to attempt it. The CDC even directly states that LGBTQ people are placed at higher risk because of how they are mistreated and stigmatized in society. The Trevor Project also reports that 36% of LGBTQ youth have been physically threatened or harmed due to their sexual orientation or gender identity. Worst of all, they estimate that one LGBTQ youth aged 13 to 24 attempts suicide every 45 seconds in the United States, which they say is a low estimate. Not to mention the countless acts of hatred and violence towards the LGBT community every year. Just this past November, a shooting in a Colorado LGBTQ nightclub killed five and left 25 others injured. This should not be real. People should not be dying in nightclubs. I should not personally know people and have friends who have attempted. I should not have to worry about if my friends will kill themselves based on how society treats them. I should not have friends who receive death threats to which their school says there's nothing we can do. I should not have to worry about if my friends or I will get assaulted or even murdered one day for something that cannot be controlled. 
I should not have to worry about what will happen next in school, a supposed safe space. And I should not have to mentally prepare myself every single time I walk down the hallway for the next time that someone decides to call me a fucking faggot. But this is reality, and this is my reality. The worst part is there isn't a quick and easy solution. Education only works on those with open minds, and most people aren't fond of admitting they're wrong and letting go of their previous opinions, no matter how hateful they are. What needs to happen is a cultural shift, a cultural shift where everyone can feel safe and accepted in society, and these ill-informed opinions disappear. We must start this conversation. We must demand action. We cannot let these misguided laws and ideas poison our country further. If any generation can do it, it's ours. Nearly two-thirds of Gen Z say they are worried about the future of LGBTQ rights. Now is the time for action. Now is the time to speak up. Together, we can be the ones to foster a safe, welcoming environment where future generations, our own children, can feel perfectly safe and comfortable just simply walking down the hallway. Ian, thank you so much for your bravery and vulnerability. Can I get a show of hands? How many people have felt moved by a speech they heard tonight? Yeah, absolutely. How many people felt so moved that you want to take action on some of these issues? Thank you so much. There is so much power in this room. Think about what we can do all together. Carla, who's our next speaker? Up next, we have a senior from International High School at Langley Park. Langley Park, Maryland, part of Prince George County. Um, Prince George County not only does soapbox, but they actually institutionalize student voice committees in all the schools throughout the county. It's pretty great. Um, and according to the speaker, youth voice matters because we are the future, not just for our country, but for the entire world. Please help me welcome to the stage, Jessica Garcia. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jessica Garcia, and I would like to ask you, is education a right or a privilege? Let me begin with a personal story. I am a senior at the International High School at Langley Park, and during this year, I started looking forward for my higher education. But on my way, I found some limitations, economic limitations. I am seeing myself in a position where I cannot afford four years of college, and I can and because of my undocumented status, I cannot apply for federal financial aid. I was told that it would be hard and almost impossible for me to cover all my college expenses since I don't have the financial support of my family. I am one of the students with the highest GPA at the school, and I have worked so hard these four years. One of my dreams is being able to continue with my higher education should I give up on my dream just because it is too expensive? During my research for scholarships, I saw that most of them were just for US citizens or for those that come with a social security number. Despite not being able to afford college on my own, I was lucky. I have people that believe in me and nominate me for a private scholarship. But even with this amazing award, I still need to pay for things such as books, transportation, health insurance. And I'm not eligible to work study because it is a federal program. I was lucky, but my peers didn't come with the same luck as me. I, I have seen how students give up on their dreams because they cannot afford college. 
Peer Research Center reports that the personal annual income of an immigrant family is $30,000. And the education data reports that the average cost of college is $35,000 per year. Does that sound affordable for an immigrant family? Nelson Mandela once said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. So why not to invest in those that cannot afford it? Not just for them, but to make a change in our community, in our country, in the world. Based on education data initiatives, just a 13% of immigrant graduates from a bachelor's degree in the United States. And the total number of immigrants is the 26% of the American population. This means that just a half of the immigrant population graduates from college. The students that are at school right now are the future of this country, with the dream of becoming future doctors, teachers, scientists, engineers, or lawyers. It is our responsibility to make sure that all students have the same access to the same resources, regardless of their background, so they can succeed. Let us remember that America is a nation of immigrants that has helped to make this America, America the great nation that is today. As I said earlier in this speech, Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Unfortunately, many undocumented immigrants are weaponless. Change the world. Help undocumented immigrants get access to a better education and to never give up their dreams just because it is too expensive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. We are now about to hear our last speech. Um, but I want you to know that although today is a celebration and a showcase, it is by no means the last you'll hear from our young people. They are excited to continue to speak their mind, and I am excited to be in front of so many more young people that I'm sure are going to continue to speak their mind. Um, so our democracy requires it, so please keep doing it. Keep talking about what you care about, and let's hear that last speech. All right, our last speaker is a senior at Phillips Ace High School right here in DC, hometown. Yeah. DC has been a chapter, a mikvah chapter since 2014. I know there's a lot of young folks in the audience who are part of that work, who are in the Elections and Action Council where they help influence elections and get involved even before they're able to vote. I know a lot of folks in the audience are part of the Citywide Student Voice Council where they are bringing their expertise to address the myriad of issues that face our schools today. Uh, we're really grateful to be here in your town bringing all these powerful voices to the stage. Our next speaker, when we asked him why youth voice matters, he said, because young people have the power to change the world. Do we not agree? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please welcome Jermaine Smith to the stage. Retaliation, respect. This is all the young boy knows. Shots, shots, shots. This is all he hears, as now those bullets become music to his ears. A lack of guidance and structure only leads to crime within our community, as a man of the opposing race may walk down the street and his look pass as if he is the dust in the wind. But a man that looks like the boy is a target and maybe a threat. The boy only knows money, murder, and madness. The boy's enemy number one is not only the stigma society puts on him, but also the other boy, who is nothing but a carbon copy of him, with just minor differences in his story. 
<laughs> the boys in <laughs> studies from the U.S. Department of Justice shows black homicide rates are seven to eight times higher than those of whites. And also, according to FBI data, of the 2,491 murders of black people reported in the U.S. in 2013, 2,245 of those perpetrators were black. And 189 of those perpetrators were white. The boy thinks he's alone in this cruel world. As unbeknownst to him, he has been public enemy number one since the day he was born. Terrorizer, thug, threat. This is how he is seen to the general eye. In our communities, there should be a chance for our young black boys and girls to hear about career choices and mentorship, knowing that there is someone out there that cares about them. There should be programs set in place in our recreation centers to shed light upon trades. With teaching our young kids how to conduct themselves in a positive manner, giving them the tools to succeed in the world where they are counted out. Opportunity, optimism, obedience. This is what the boy needs. Shots, shots, shots. The boy no longer thinks of bullets when he hears shots, but now he thinks of a chance in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Jermaine. Can we get one more enormous round of wild applause for all our speakers tonight? Go ahead and stand up. Yeah, y'all deserve that wild applause. Big time. And I want to thank our really incredibly supportive audience here, listening and learning from these powerful young speakers. I know we are all leaving changed after hearing what they have to say tonight. So really grateful for everyone here taking the time and paying attention to our young people. You know we need to do that more often. And also, it would not be a mikvah event if we didn't do what, Carla? Head, heart, feet. What? <laughs> what are you talking about, Carla? Um, we're, we, it would not be mikvah if we did not give the mic to the audience, to the young people, to hear about what you felt, what you learned, and what you are walking away with. So Mia with the flat shoes is walking up to the stage, <laughs> just walking down with the mic. And we want to hear what you guys learned. So that's your head. What did you learn today? what you had heart, what you felt today, and then feet, what you guys are walking away with. So um, if you can just raise your hand if you're like, I need to share what I learned today, or I need to share what I felt today, or I need to share what I'm walking away with today, please do so. And Mia is going to go over and pass the mic to you so you can share with, with the audience. Ready, set, raise your hands. Mia's going, Mia's going. There's one over there, Mia. Um, I'd just like to say that it's time for not only grown-ups, I'm talking about people in the world, to stand up and realize that we don't have all the answers. Sometimes we got to listen to somebody else to find out what the problem is. And until we find out what the problem is, there's no way in the world that we can solve it. And if we can ha have our kids with this much knowledge telling you what's going on in the world, we as adults should know what's going on in the world. And we got to look to them to tell us that's no problem. That's my grandson right there. <laughs> Do we see some hands? I, I see a student right here, Mia. Mia, sneak in. Um, this, uh, this was a great experience. I learned a lot today, but, uh, my biggest takeaway was from, uh, Ryan Volp. Uh, his speech was very, very, uh, eye-opening and amazing. I did it for my soapbox. I did men's mental health as well. So it's nice to know that, you know, uh, we're not alone. And something that I'm going to take away from his speech is that the fact that he brought up veterans, and that's something that I don't understand how it could pass over my head. 
especially since I want to go into the military myself and I did a speech on men's uh, mental health. It's just very eye-opening. That's something like that could go over my head, but this young gentleman, uh, he brought it out so well and really made me understand and think. So I'm very appreciative. Woo! I'd like to say thank you to all the speakers. You were truly amazing. Um, everything that you've said, I'll carry with me. I think it's amazing that you were given the opportunity for young people to come up and speak about what they care about. It's, it's amazing that we all get to see that and um, that you were able to speak on things that maybe people haven't heard before. So thank you. We have the hands over here in the middle. She'll come to you, she'll come to you. I felt that it was really important to learn about all these things because most of them I have never heard of before, but like hearing about them now, it makes me like want people to actually do something about all these issues because I feel like everyone should hear what is going on in the world, not just like certain things, just everything that is like a problem for most people like in our society and like, yeah. People in the middle, Mia. People in the middle. Hi. Um, seconding what the other girl said, thank you guys for the speeches. They were really good. I, I learned a lot. I think the biggest takeaway for me was that um, there are two sides to every story. Like some of the speeches that people made, some of the points I may have not I may have not necessarily agreed with but I'm taking away the fact that I should be open to other sides because it helps better underst helps me better understand why people feel what how they feel and how I can talk to them about it. And I'm also encouraged by the people speaking knowing that young people do have voices and that I don't have to keep silent about what I'm passionate about. Okay, one more. One more. Hello, so my biggest takeaway from this event, totally, and I just want to give a huge shout out to people over there, give the speeches. Um, I thought that the bravery that they had to really just put a light on situations that, because everyone, we know that everyone has problems. Like, um, we all hide our problems sometimes because we want to appear strong, but I feel like when they decide to really show problems that exist in our society. It, it takes a lot of bravery because we know that our society, like we like to be comfortable. We like to live our, I don't know, live our jobs, go home, sleep. But we often sleep knowing that there's, sometimes we don't even know there's problems, but we like living that comfortable life. And what they really did is that they got outside their comfort zone. They, um, really decided to be different and unique, and I, I really appreciate that, and I feel like I can, I, I can only hope to be a person that can really aspire change just like them, so yeah. You can and you will be. You can and you will be. Got you. All right. So now we want to invite to the stage Verne. Oh, here you are. <laughs> Do you want... So I, I'm known to go off script. Um, I'm going to completely go off script right now. And I'm going to try to hold it in, the tears that I have. And the, the emotion, you young people are amazing. When I, when I brought up the full circle moment for me, I sat up on that stage watching other people perform here as someone 15, young black girl from St. Louis, 
had no idea what I was going to do next, and I watched somebody else perform, and it was great, and it was beautiful, but I can only imagine if I had been sitting up there listening to people who looked like me or looked different from me, had perspectives that were like mine or were different from mine, the power in what you guys just offered to us today, I, I, I don't even have enough words to describe this feeling and to lead an organization at this time in our country's history looking like me, having the ability to bring these opportunities with the help and support of so many of you out there is something that I am extremely, extremely emotional about, but also extremely grateful for. And as I said in my opening remarks, this is just a snapshot. We do this work, Mia brought up New York City, 200,000 young people in New York City have had this experience where somebody asked them the question and gave them space to answer, 200,000. The work that we do at Mikva Challenge is more important now than it ever has been. I do want to take a moment and acknowledge our founder. A lot of people hear Mikvah Challenge, are like, what's Mikvah? It's a Jewish bath. No, there was a man. <laughs> there was a man named Abner Mikvah, and he and his wife, Zoe, had the vision for this organization. And they believed that if we start with young people early, if we help them to discover the power of their voice early, they will stay civically engaged for life. And our data shows us that when we engage with our students earlier, they vote, they care about their communities, they support one another. You heard it in this room. I had a young man sitting right next to me said, I didn't realize refugee issues were that important. We don't know because we don't talk to each other. We don't. But our young people are. And I am so proud. I'm so proud. I'm so proud to give them a platform. To give them a platform to talk to one another, to help them to develop empathy for one another, to help them to understand their perspectives, and to work together. Because what these 100 young people are going to do over the next two days, they're going to talk about mental health. They're going to talk about education. They're going to talk about gun control. They're going to talk about climate change. They're going to talk about civil and human rights together. And they're going to share how these issues impact them. And leaders from across this city are going to come and work with them not talk to them, not talk at them. They're going to come and talk to them. And we all are going to leave forever changed. And I guarantee you, because of the work that these young people have done over the past year and are going to continue to do, we as a country are going to be changed. We are going to be changed because of what the, you've already seen it. You've already heard it. So I am honored. I am proud. I am grateful for the work of the young people here. I also want to, again, to Ford's Theater for giving us this forum so that granddad's grandson can get up on this stage I'm so proud. Mikva Challenge staff, if you are in the building, can you stand or wave your hand? Woo! 
We do this work from, we do this work from west to east because of the staff, because of their commitment, because of their passion, because they know that by investing in young people, our country has changed forever. I also want to acknowledge and thank our board. I've seen several of our board members in the room. If you're on the MICFA Challenge National Board or the DC Advisory Board or the, even the Illinois Advisory Board and you're here, would you please stand and wave your hand? I know I saw Steph over here. Thank you. We cannot do this work without the staff. We cannot do this work without the board. We cannot do this work without key partnerships. I know that we've got Verone Kennedy from New York City Public Schools. I hate to start naming names because I know I'm going to miss somebody, but I know um, New York City is in the room. If you are our district partner, Jenna, also Rael, are just amazing partner from New York who helps to make sure we bring this work. If you're one of our district partners and you brought students here, I flew with the group from Madison, Wisconsin, because I'm based in Chicago. If you are a district partner, if you could please stand, just want to make sure that we acknowledge we cannot do this work without you. Thank you. Something that was important to us, we wanted to make sure for those who were local, it's easier for families to travel. Something that was important to us is that we allowed parents to come and travel from across the country. So these 13 young people also have an adult, a caring adult, whether it's parent, grandparent, neighbor, that traveled with them so that they can see them in this space and on this stage. Parents, guardians, if you might, don't mind standing or waving your hand. Again, none of this would be possible without the generosity of our sponsors. The Allstate Foundation is our signature sponsor. This was a dream we had. This was a dream. Can we bring students here, have them on a stage, and then get to work? This was a dream. And the Allstate Foundation, the Jack Cook Foundation, and Orbit Incorporated helped us to make this possible. So I want to make sure that we do that. All right, I'm going to get my emotions together and get back on the script. I think I thanked everyone. Um, again, thank teachers, thank district partners, um, thank families, thank staff. Uh, thank you all for coming. Did I miss someone? Oh, the interpreters. I am so sorry. Absolutely. We are actually hosting our summit at Gallaudet University, um, where our young people, again, another perspective as we think and how we navigate that space for students who are hearing impaired just gives them another lens, another glimpse of the world. And I'm, again, something that I'm extremely proud of. Um, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. I encourage you to take a moment, shake the hands of these young people. I'm actually gonna ask all the young people who gave speeches tonight to join me on stage, please. If you were inspired by our young people, one way that we keep this work going is that we have corporate sponsors who sponsor this event. We have individual sponsors. We cannot do this work for free. If you would like to support MICFA Challenge, I encourage you to go to mikvachallenge.org. There are spaces on our website where you can support our work, mikvachallenge.org slash donate, or text MICFA to 44321. And there's, more, there's also some information on your program. We invest in a lot of things. We have to invest in our young people. You all have seen just a slice. I, I want to step to the side because I should not be the spotlight. I just want us to think, what will each of these young people 
be. Again, I was a young person who sat up there. We don't know what they're going to be. But we are investing in them. We, their families, their teachers, their districts, their school, this city, this country, should be making the investments in these young people because they are going to be the change that our country needs. I thank you all for coming tonight and hope that you stay connected with us. Let's give these young people one more round of applause. You look a lot like myself.